The next important realization we get from the modern synthesis and population genetics is the forces of evolution. These are what actually cause change in a population. From Darwin, we got the understanding of natural selection, but some time has passed since then, and we have a much larger understanding of evolution, and there's a lot more that can happen. And we understand this through the forces of evolution. A force of evolution is simply anything that can cause a change in allele frequency. So remember, our definition of evolution is now change in allele frequency, so a force of evolution is something that can cause evolution to happen. We have four forces of evolution. We have mutation, genetic drift, gene flow, and selection. So let's talk about these one by one. Mutations, these are simply errors. These are mistakes. So this is some mistake in your genome that is not corrected. This is important because our cells have many different mechanisms to identify um, mistakes in the genome and to fix them. But sometimes they are not corrected before the cell divides and then they are passed on to daughter cells. And that is when they truly become a mutation. If it is simply an error that hasn't been corrected yet, it is not yet a mutation. There's a couple other words that are helpful. It, de novo means new. So this is just a brand new mutation that just happened. And mutation is special when we're talking about the forces of evolution, because this is the only one that creates brand new variation. There are many, many different types of mutation. Here I've shown a point mutation. So there's a, just a single change at one base pair um, and then a frame shift mutation. So a frame shift you can either add or delete, but then you're actually causing the frame of the codon to shift and you cause a whole cascade of differences to happen. But let's talk about some other specific examples of mutation. Um, one phenomenon is called Muller's ratchet. And this is the idea that there is a slow accumulation of deleterious alleles because of the constant flow of mutation. This really um, happens mostly in things that don't recombine. So we're talking about asexual organisms, primarily single cellular celled ones, but also the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA, since these do not recombine. Um, recombination is one way that we can create new um, variants and basically throw away all the ones that we don't like. Um, recombination is really cool because now we can um, put together new combinations of alleles. So we have maybe alleles from different genes might work really well together. Um, it might be good, but of course, remember, it might be bad. But this is one of the ways that we can try out new variations, um, which selection can later act upon. Um, what's also interesting is the rate of recombination is not uniform. So there are particular hot spots on chromosomes where recombination will happen um, very often in other parts where it just won't happen very often at all. Um, so think of it as there's like discrete, discrete chunks of our chromosomes that we can swap back and forth. Um, and we don't necessarily understand why this happens, though we do understand that it does. Or we don't, we understand why it happens because we, it's advantageous to keep certain parts of the chromosome together, but we don't understand how, which is kind of cool. Um, strictly speaking, this is not a force of evolution because it does not cause allele frequency to change, but it does deal with gene interactions. Um, the forces of evolution are a great way to understand evolution, but really only looking at one gene and um, the alleles of it is a pretty simplistic way to look at evolution because we are integrated organisms with so many different genes. So recombination is still a very important um, force, even if it's not technically a force of evolution. Another interesting concept is outbreeding depression. Uh, most people have heard of inbreeding depression, but outbreeding is the opposite. So this is where you can actually get a drop in fitness um, because you are breaking apart fav favorable allele combinations. So occasionally, if you reproduce with someone outside of your population, you could have a drop in fitness for your children. But let's talk about our next force of evolution, genetic drift. This is the least understood one. And really, that's because it's random. And randomness isn't particularly well understood. The uh, technical way to understand this, it is stochastic sampling error. And this is the just the product that populations are finite. They are not infinite. And this means if you have a small population, just by chance, um, the next generation is going to be a little bit different. Um, and this is much, much stronger in smaller populations. 
Genetic drift um, reduces variation because here, alleles can either be lost from a population or they can be fixed and be the only allele present. Uh, let's look at this in an example. So here we have a population of beetles. We have black and white ones. And just due to chance, um, only three of them survive. So it could be a natural disaster or it could really have nothing to do with it because this is a tiny population. So it's not inconceivable for only those three to survive and have offspring. Um, genetic drift is interesting to model and people like to do this a lot. So here we have three different populations and we're looking at populations of different orders of magnitude. We have a population of 20, 200, and 2,000. So you can see in a population of 20, the allele frequency actually changes quite a bit, um, but it changes less so in our population of 200, and actually it's fairly stable when we get to a population of 2,000. So the larger a population is, the less susceptible it is to genetic drift. You can think of this as if you have a population of 20 and you just swap out one single allele, that's a pretty big percentage um, of your population. Remember, frequencies are the important number here. But in a population of 2,000, switch out one allele, that really does not change the frequency hardly at all. But there are also a couple um, of examples of genetic drift that are important to understand. The first one is the bottleneck effect. This is a temporary dramatic reduction in population size. So here we can visualize it through a bottleneck for which it's named. Our original population has a lot of genetic variation, which is illustrated here through having a lot of different colors in our bottle. But we have some catastrophic event, a bottleneck, and only a few survivors actually make it. And then when the population returns to its normal size, it has reduced variation because only a few were able to survive. Um, we see a few examples in modern day elephant seals and cheetahs. Um, with elephant seals, we actually don't really know why. Um, their populations right now are doing pretty okay. Um, so there was some historic uh, bottleneck effect that is causing their uh, reduction in genetic variation. Cheetahs, uh, we don't know why. That's our fault. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, save endangered animals. Let's be better about the environment. The other example we want to understand for genetic drift is the founder effect. This is slightly different, but similar. So now we have a big original population, but a few of those individuals actually move and form a new population somewhere else. And because it's only a few individuals, they do not have all of the genetic variation present in their founding population. So all of their descendants are gonna have slightly reduced variation. This is probably the most important one you wanna remember for when we talk about human migration and human variation later on. Next, let's talk about gene flow. Now we're talking about two different populations and they are mixing. So they're sharing um, individuals or genes between them. So you can visualize it here. We have one tan beetle that's moving and gonna make a home with our green beetles here. Um, gene flow is interesting because it, um, it actually makes populations more similar and it prevents these populations from speciating and becoming different species. Um, gene flow is very complicated, though, because it really depends on the specific model you're talking about. A common one is the island model. So you can imagine you have a big continent and a small island. So you pretty much have unidirectional gene flow from the continent to the island. You can also have like an N island model. So a bunch of different islands that all trade back and forth. Or you have the stepping stone model um, or this linear model where it's, you know, kind of based on distance between all of the different populations. So you wanna be really careful about what you're talking about with gene flow and the scenario really depends on what exactly is gonna happen. Lastly, we wanna talk about selection. Uh, and now we're talking about differential survival and reproduction. We're talking about that stuff we learned from Darwin. But notice I simply said selection. There's a couple different kinds, natural selection, sexual selection, artificial selection. When we're talking about population genetics, we kind of don't really care which one. All we're referring to is that this is a directed, purposeful process. So through artificial selection, we got our woolly sheep. And through sexual selection, we got these um, gorgeous peacock tails that are, you know, detrimental to them actually flying. Um, selection. Unlike the other ones, this removes deleterious phenotypes. So it is a purposeful um, process. Diversifying selection is rare, but it does occasionally happen where selection is now for two different phenotypes and not the one in the middle. Um, through this, it is not really survival of the fittest. We're really thinking of this as reproduction of the good enough. More on that later.
But let's talk about the effects of these different forces of evolution, um, because it's helpful to consider um, how they are different from each other. Mutation increases variation, because now we're getting new um, alleles, new forms present. Genetic drift decreases variation, so it's sometimes called a negative force, because we are losing variation from our population. Gene flow increases variation because we're probably getting new alleles from this other population. And selection, it usually decreases variation because it's usually removing individuals that are no longer fit from our population. But all of these, now we're thinking about like one population and how it affects just one at a time. Now let's compare what these, uh, what forces of evolution do when we're comparing two different populations. Mutation tends to increase the difference between two populations because mutation will happen differently in each population. Same for genetic drift. Um, randomly, genetic drift will probably have a different result in two different populations. Gene flow actually is opposite though. Gene flow between two populations keeps them more similar and prevents speciation from happening. Um, selection, it really depends on what's going on, but is more likely to increase differences between populations, assuming that the selective forces are different in each population. So what does the force of evolution do and what are they?